How many people here have seen or heard of the Broadway musical Avenue Q? Breezy, whimsical, social commentary sort of show. And there's one song in Avenue Q that, uh, that kind of applies in both the title and the recurring theme in that song are, it sucks to be you. And that's sort of what you're looking at here. Is that what's going to happen? Is this a day when it's going to suck to be you? Or are you going to do something else with it? Are you going to grasp it, embrace it, and take it someplace, yourself and with all the people with whom you work? Because what you face, what you confront, of course, is a crisis, a big one in this case, but there are lots of them that various of us face. And there are lots of ways to talk about crises and to represent them. The Chinese write the word crisis by using two characters. One means danger, and the other means opportunity. And of course, that's what's going on here, and that's what I was talking about a minute ago. Amidst all the danger comes an opportunity to do something. And this isn't a representation that I, or that I came up with myself. People look to this frequently in order to think through the, the, the dangers and the opportunities that they confront in crisis. And it also happens when one faces this sort of public crisis, public event, that people want to show up and find out what's going on. They want to ask questions, and they come flooding in. And if you're not particularly fortunate, they may even find you and start asking questions of you. And that really gets your attention. And so you have to decide, with this crisis, what's it going to mean? What are we going to do with it? Well, one thing we all know, and all of you know it, I'm sure, is that crisis doesn't produce character. It reveals it. Just as crisis doesn't produce preparedness, it reveals whether you and your organization have done your job to get ready or not. It reveals whether you, the leader, have gotten people ready. Because the time will come when you're going to have to trust a whole lot of them in very, very difficult circumstances. There's a, <clears throat> a moment every year that we have at the Boston Marathon when we fire the gun, 30,000 people go down the road and head off, and a few of us who are the organizers look at each other and say, well, that's that. There go 30,000 people, and we, we have just handed them over to 10,000 volunteers and about 500,000 spectators that we don't know. Hope they're ready. So one thing that one really has to know going into one of these things is everything one can know about the context of engagement and preparedness of all of those people in that environment in which you're going to have to operate in this most exigent of circumstances. In Boston, there's one fact that defines that environment for us. It's a simple thing, and it's just this. In Boston, everyone owns the marathon. They're engaged and they're prepared. All right, so in Boston, everyone owns the marathon. Great, you might say, well, so what? And by the way, how would you know that? Well, the so what is that without that, that ownership, that engagement of everybody, that level of preparedness among everybody who is any, in any way connected to that event, nothing that happened after the bombs went off in 2013 makes any sense. None of what came to be known as Boston Strong makes any sense. And how do we know it? Well, we see it in a lot of things. We see it in things that you might find around the house, like trash. What you see here on the screen is the Boston Marathon course near the end of the race. And what's out on the course there are a lot of paper cups. And that's the trash that usually follows the race. People run, they get water or Gatorade, they drink it, they drop the cup. And we clean it up afterwards, and it's pretty simple. But not always. In 2012, on a very hot day, a very dangerous day to run, at the end of the race, that course looked like a garbage can. It was littered and covered with banana peels and orange rinds and beverage cups and containers that had held ice and frozen beverages that people who lived along the course had gone out and spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy to take care 
of their runners on their course. Why would they do that? Because in Boston, everyone owns the marathon. They're engaged and they're prepared.